Hey, how's it going? Uh, you remember my last video? I launched this new DIY guitar kit. It's a sort of growing, evolving thing. And I've started by launching it with the digital download files. If you don't know what I'm talking about, here's a link somewhere on the screen. You can go check that out. But so um, over the next few months, I'm gonna be heading back to that and creating some videos about the process of making the guitars using this kit because uh, I feel like it'll be useful to people who are interested in it and uh, you know, maybe filling some gaps here and there, but I think other people just find it useful too, even if you're not buying my kit, because uh, what I'm going to do is show the process of how I make a guitar, basically. So, um, you'll remember the, the prior video I showed that I had this original body and neck I cut out, and I'm going to finish those and make a guitar from that. But I thought what might be better to do is sort of film the process of me stocking the store with some of these parts that I'm going to be stocking, and I'll, I'll show so people who bought the, the CNC files can see how I turn those files into the parts. Um, so today we're going to start at the very beginning, and I'm going to show you how I turned a block of wood into this neck blank, and this another block of wood into this fingerboard blank, and we'll we'll start there. This is the Vectric software version of the downloads available in the package kit that I already have available in the store. And if you're not using Vectric Aspire, first off, you should be. <laughs> and if you're not, then you would need to build this up yourself from the DXFs and the models and whatnot that are included in there. So your neck blank needs to be about 20 inches by 3 inches by 0.32 inches, as you can see there on the left. Um, and then on the right, I have all of the tool paths that I've already created. And a couple things I just wanted to point out about creating tool paths. You'll see here that my model is actually a little bit smaller than my actual uh, block of wood. So there's a little bit extra that needs to come off of the wood, which you want, of course. It can't be bigger than the wood. Um, and you can see uh, I'm messing around on the right-hand side there with where I put that waist. I could put it underneath it so my model is carved in and then there's extra wood below, or I can put it above so the extra wood is carved away, which is what I'm, of course, choosing to do. Otherwise, my fingerboard would be thicker than I want it. But if you want your fingerboard a little bit thicker, you could actually just make that block of wood a little bit thicker and add some of it to the bottom. You'll also notice that I have two what are called finishing tool paths in there that are almost identical. And what that is is I'm using a quarter-inch ball nose end mill to radius out and carve the shape of my fingerboard. And the reason I'm doing it twice is because of the process I'm going to use for inlays, which you'll get to see a little bit later in the video. Um, right now I'm just toggling through. Now my next set of cuts are all using a eighth inch end mill. Um, and I just grouped them all together so I can do them all at once because it just saves me the trouble of switching back and forth. And the thing I want to do is cut out the position markers. So what I first want to do is run that first tool path here. You can see I'm removing all the excess wood and getting my 16 inch radius. And then I want to run all of my end mill tool paths with the eighth inch end mill. And that makes my little position markers, my nut slot, and actually cuts the final profile out. So now here in the real world, I'll fill in those holes, those inlays with epoxy, and then I will uh, go back and run the other tool path I have, which cross hatches at, at the opposite 90 degree angle, and clean off all the excess epoxy, and then run my fret slots and peel it up off the wasteboard. I'll be done. And here's the computer simulation happening in real life. Um, you'll notice I'm doing a batch right now. I was actually doing three of each while I filmed this. And uh, the other thing you'll see is that the way I mounted this wood to my wasteboard is the old two-sided masking tape trick. And if you don't know what that is, I do it a lot, and I have other videos where I talk more about it. But basically, you put masking tape on the back of your work, masking tape on your uh, your CNC machine, you put super glue on the masking tape, you hold the piece down with a little bit of weight for a few minutes, and that just sticks it down with your own homemade double-sided tape and it works better than store-bought double-sided tape because the the glue is better and whatnot and then it all just peels apart real easy so here you can see now i'm doing all my end mill cuts to get it ready for the next step first i did my quarter inch tool path uh finishing tool path to give it the shape then i ran all of my eighth inch end mill passes which give me these holes the profile the nut slot and all that stuff um, but really all i wanted to do was do that that finish pass and get these holes in i just did the rest for efficiency um, because i want to get epoxy into these holes before i go home tonight so i'm going to use this wire brush to just clean up these holes Now before I put epoxy in these holes, I want to seal the wood a little bit. Um, sometimes I don't, and I just put the epoxy in and I let it sort of bleed through the grain a little bit. Uh, but sometimes I don't want that look and I want it to look a little more precise. So I'm going to just use a little bit of shellac. 
just get the holes. I'm not worried about getting the whole fingerboard because it's all gonna get machined off in the next step. Let me show you the difference here. On this one, I used CA glue and I was trying to do it quickly and I didn't seal it first. And I could have sealed it with CA glue first, but I just went quick and I got this bleed. You get these lines. Whereas this one, I did what I just did now and I sealed it first. And now you don't really see any of that. This is just some two-part epoxy and a little bit of black tint. You could also use wooden dowels or create new shapes and do your own thing with this too. So now I don't have to worry about getting this in the hole perfectly uh, because we're going to run to that finishing tool path again uh, and even this all out. So I'm going to just go, I'm going to start back here and just... Now you'll notice that I did not, even though I've already cut my final profile path out, I'm not removing the wood that is the trim because I will need that to reset my height on uh, my end mill when I go back to do all this. If I remove that, I would no longer have my initial start height reference available to me. So just pull the air bubbles out, but you want to be careful not to blast for too long. So when I came in the next morning, I just reset my machine and then ran the other finishing tool path in the opposite uh, crosshatch direction, cleaned off all the excess epoxy. And here I noticed that I didn't do a good job sealing it. I only did one coat of shellac last night, which was not enough to prevent a little bit of bleeding. So I still have that sort of rustic look that most of my stuff has, because I usually don't do that step. I just sort of let it bleed. Um, whereas on this fingerboard, I did two coats and you can see it prevented that altogether. So live and learn, definitely need to do more than one. I'm just trying not to be wasteful of all that chemical, you know? For the frets, I'm going to use this really small end mill and I'm showing you where I buy them on eBay. This guy sells the used ones for way less um, and they don't last as long, of course, but uh, they seem to do the job well. And um, you could also use a V-bit if you don't want to spend the money on, on one of these. If you just use like a small V-bit, like this one that's actually a little bit shot, and maybe just cut, you know, like 0.03 inches deep or something like that, that would give you the line that you could then finish uh, with your saw. Because if you go too deep and it gets too wide, your fret won't seat good. A couple settings to note. I'm going to go very slow and uh, make very shallow passes with this little skinny end mill. And I'm going to cut right on the line, not around it because it's just a single tool path. And I'm also going to want to make sure that I'm projecting my tool path onto the shape of the fingerboard I've already created. Because if I don't do that, it'll actually not cut in as deep on the ends that are a little bit lower because of that radius. You can see how slow I'm going here. This is real time. And I'm only cutting a slot that's 0 0.08 inches deep. And uh, my end mill is, you know, about 0 0.02 inches wide. So you don't want to cut any deeper than half the diameter of that. So that means it's eight passes like this of, of this little teeny tiny end mill cutting through the wood. But, uh, I mean, you can get the accuracy that way, that's for sure. I know it does feel a little bit wasteful to use this much masking tape and CA glue every time I cut a fingerboard, but uh, I do believe it is worth it in this case, and, uh, and I make those ecological saves elsewhere in my life. Depending upon your machine and your settings and stuff, you'll see a little bit of machine mark on the wood that you might just want to sand out before you put frets in. And so uh, I always just sort of, using a 16 inch radius block, because this is a 16 inch radius. Don't have a 16 inch radius sanding block? You can just make one real quick by just basically doing the opposite shape of this fingerboard on your CNC machine into a block of wood. Uh, I always give this a, a quick sand and, uh, and finish first before I put frets in. And lately I've been actually finishing the fingerboard before I put frets in, so I don't have to finish it afterwards, which is hard. Uh, and that way, uh, seems to be working a little bit better. You're also probably going to want to put side position markers um, so you can see where you put your fingers while you play. And uh, I always use these little scraps left over from um, rivet guns, these little pieces of metal. I just uh, find the center, drill a little hole, bang those things in. They sell little pieces of plastic or wood that work the same way, or you could fill it with epoxy, or you could make your own little dowel, whatever you want. Now let's cut some neck blanks. Um, I have here a piece of poplar, 
uh, and then I have a glue up of some some other stuff and some glue ups here they're all about 28 inches by about four inches by 0.8 inches thick and that's uh, what the file calls for so uh, I'm gonna start by screwing these down to the board you can see I drilled some little holes in the corners I went really close to the corners um, to really try to protect my my interests and um, we'll just start by screwing them down to the board and we're gonna do the whole top of the neck first Let's look at that CNC file in the kit. And of course I'm using my Aspire file again. If you don't use Aspire, just build your own model. But here you can see looking at the top, I definitely want to start with the top side. And um, there's just a few basic cuts here. I need to cut a slot for my truss rod. And then I wanted to just reduce the height of the head just a little bit where the tuning pegs are going to go. Um, and that's pretty much it. And you'll also see that there are these guides, these little circles on the outside of the neck. And we'll talk about those in a second. So. In this case, my model is exactly the same height as my block of wood, so there's not really any waste on either side. Uh, I just make sure that that block is centered in there. And uh, all of the top cuts are made with a quarter inch end mill, so I can group all those together, do them at once, except for I do a finishing tool path with a quarter inch ball nose that I need to do on that headstock too. And so you can see I'm just organizing my files there and getting them ready to cut. So then first I'm gonna do all of those cuts on the top. Then I'm going to remove the piece of wood from my CNC and drill those guide holes in reverse into my CNC router's tabletop right into the bed so I can properly line up the block of wood when it's flipped over and make sure everything's going to line up okay. And I'm going to show you all this in a minute, but so there you can see it's all pretty basic on the top side. The software doesn't get it, but these three holes will actually get drilled into my work bed, not the piece of wood. And then I have to do a roughing tool path on the back to get some of that excess wood away. And then a finishing tool path with a quarter inch ball nose end mill to get my whole shape mo that, that's modeled there out. And then I just go back to the quarter inch end mill to cut a profile out and remove it from its waist. Now today I'm making some of the blank headstock variety of this type of neck. But you can see here in the kit also has a inline six headstock that I designed in created just for this and so this all would get cut exactly the same the only difference would be that the profile is different and there is a uh, few extra holes to drill for the tuners that will go in there uh, whereas with the blank headstock you have to find the location where you're gonna put those and shape that and do that all out by hand which some people really enjoy but uh, I didn't want to make it so anybody that bought this kit was married to this headstock it's pretty generic so you do have the opportunity to do something um, a little more creative so what I'm doing here that's probably different than what you're going to do is I'm doing them in batches. So I have all of my code saved and just every time I run it, instead of changing the end mill to go to the next step, I just change the zero, the beginning spot on my CNC to a new location and then run the file again. And that way it's just like a little bit more efficient. In the future, I do plan on just creating a file that just has multiple necks built into my my board or whatever I just haven't gotten around to it yet this only just takes a minute for me to step away and and set it and get it going again which I don't mind doing just to kind of keep an eye on things and make sure everything's going okay because if I had this machine running a four hour long program something went wrong an hour in and I wasn't paying attention I would you know waste a lot more stuff than I need to this way um, I'm always up to snuff and seeing what's going on so if that one was wrong I can fix it on the next one then I only waste one instead of all There's good old sheetrock screws is all I need to hold these down and then I just set my Z depth and I'm good to go, ready to start cutting out some necks. Okay, we'll skip through a bunch of the CNC viewing and you understand I just made some basic cuts, all like the stuff we looked at before, but now let's talk about flipping these pieces over. You can see here I drilled those holes into the wood and I put in these little dowels and I actually set those holes to be the size of about an old piece of scrap pencil. So I'm using little pieces of pencil for dowels. And now I go and I drill the mirror image of those into my wasteboard and mark them with a Sharpie. So I take those dowels from that block of wood, line them up into those holes. I know my block is exactly where it needs to be for all of my cuts to line up with the cuts I've already made. And there you go. I just start doing the other side. It's a really easy way to do it. Now one thing you'll notice is I put those those spots in those little dowels randomly so I can't accidentally have it in reverse because if I put them up geometrically I could p accidentally put the neck in upside down if they're all say exactly a half inch from the corner or something like that. So that's why they're random. The Aspire file has some tabs modeled into it that you will need to cut. Um, I always just use these little um, oscillating tools uh, that work pretty well and I did put a tab into the heel of it which uh, maybe I shouldn't have but you definitely want to make sure you round that off properly on uh, 
you know, like a router, to, because otherwise it'll affect the fit of your neck into the pocket. But be careful doing this. Don't forget that you can't just go and edge trim this whole piece because that uh, guide bearing, if you go any further than there, is going <laughs> to not touch wood and you're going to wreck your neck. So just be real careful doing that. And that's how you take those digital files off the computer and make them real pieces of wood in the real world that you can make a guitar with. I need to hire a model. So here is the fingerboard. This is basically exactly what it looks like right off of the CNC machine, except for I did sand it. I started at about 80 grit and worked my way up to about 320. Um, and then we'll go through the next processes later. And I also, I used, uh, I just put a little side markers in here. They're just roughed in right now. I used uh, little pieces of steel from the pop rivets, the little center of the pop rivets. I just think that's kind of a cool little reclaim project to use. But so that's uh, what your fingerboard should look like at this point and your neck you'll see like on this one i did the the blank headstock which is kind of designed for like a three by three um you'll see it's this is just right off the cnc i haven't sanded it or anything i did make sure to carefully and properly remove this tab because this is important for it to fit good inside the pocket uh, but you'll see i left these tabs on the side i didn't clean them up yet and you can also see the way i machine and design this file there's a little bit of extra wood there like i didn't run the tool path all the way down to finish the entire arch shape of the neck and I did that on purpose for a couple reasons one is to save time and the other is to make it a little bit easier when you're gluing it together you've got a bit of a better edge it's kind of if you didn't have that little bit of wood there it'd be sort of easy to like chip it away or something before you glue this fingerboard on where it's really thin and un unprotected and so now you can line this stuff all up you just line it right up at that slot there and you can see we can we can get a nice a nice glue seam going all the way down and then once it's glued on uh, it'll be safe to just very quickly it doesn't take a lot of work at all sand that in and then of course here you can see what that kind of looks like when it's finished and this neck is not finished like I would put on a guitar it's just sanded to about 120 um, because that's the way it's gonna come to the people that purchased the pre-made parts they're not all the way finished they're just roughed in well, I hope you enjoy that and learn something. I know normally when I do videos, I don't get so into detail about all these little steps. I just sort of, you know, whiz through in a more artistic way. So maybe this will be beneficial and useful to some people. Um, so now the next step will be to add frets to this, add a truss rod to it, glue it together, and all of that fun stuff. And I uh, will do that in the next installment. Um, so what you might need to do if you're kind of doing this along with me in real time is um, go out and get yourself some fret wire as well as an 18 inch truss rod. Let me show you what I use. I'll put some links in the description and they're not affiliate links. I'm not trying to sell other people's product and make any money off of this. Um, but what I use for truss rods are these very sort of basic two-way truss rods. They're 18 inches long and you can see you can turn the Allen key one way and it'll bend down and you can turn the Allen key the other way and it'll bend up. Uh, and the truss rod slot that is designed into these necks is designed for this brand of truss rod. You'll see it'll fit perfectly right in there. So if you want to just get one of those, there's a link in the description. And then the other thing you'll need is fret wire. I buy it by um, in bulk because I do so much of this, but you might just need to buy enough for one guitar, which you can easily do uh, on eBay. And you can even buy it pre-cut, um, which will probably work with one of these. I'm not really sure. I don't see why it wouldn't. So I'll put some links to that type of stuff down below too for you to check out and get you started. And uh, next time we'll talk about how to do all that. And you can do it without spending a million dollars on tools. I'll show you the special tools that I use and I'll also show you how to not buy those special tools. All right, be good.